Ellen Swallow Richards was a Renaissance woman of the 19th century. She blazed trails for women in science. And as a young child, Ellen was like a sponge. She was very inquisitive, and so education became the answer for that. She read books all the time. She would have a book in her little bag, or she would have a book on the counter when she helped her father in the, the store. And her parents were both teachers, which was unusual at the time. Men were teachers, but there weren't that many women. So they homeschooled her until they realized that they had taught her everything that they could teach so that she needed to go on. And they actually moved from her little town in Dunstable to Westford so that she could go to an academy. When Ellen made the decision to attend Vassar, the choice for, for Vassar was because there were no other women's colleges in New England available at the time. And when she got there, the records don't say this, but I would imagine she tested out of the first two years and ultimately entered as a third year student. So she graduated in two years, but she was specifically interested in chemistry and astronomy. Early in her educational studies, she could see that scientific research had a relationship to problems of the day. And so she was led toward studying science and then specifically chemistry because she could see that chemistry research actually had application to things like air quality, water quality, the food quality, which was not that good at that time in the late 1800s. Her interests in astronomy were propelled mostly by the professor Mariah Mitchell. Mariah was one of the few women teaching in higher education. She had been trained in Europe, and she was such a strong influence that Ellen probably would have gone into astronomy if she hadn't realized early on that there was no practical application at that point. It was not going to solve the problems of the late 1800s by studying astronomy, but she was very drawn to that. Uh, she liked studying the heavens. She liked counting the stars and the meteors at night in the chemistry area. Professor Farrar's biggest influence was his practical application of science. As a, There were people who were pure scientists at that time, and most of them did not respect people who looked at the practical side of science. It just wasn't done at that time. You did the research and everything was very scientific, but nobody worried about what you did with the research. Professor Farrar, again, was ahead of his time in saying, there's a practical application to this, and we can do that. And she picked that up from him, and he continued to mentor her in, in, in that direction. After Ellen graduated from Vassar, she was a little bit of a loss wit at what to do next. She wanted to work in the chemistry area, but there was no place for her to go beyond Vassar at that time. There were no women's institutions in, in science. So she headed to Boston to talk to the chemical companies that were there to see if they would hire her. And they would not hire her. And they suggested, why don't you go apply at the new Massachusetts Institute of Technology? So she applied actually in December after she graduated from Vassar, applied to MIT and they basically wanted to ignore the application rather than give her an answer, but they finally did give her an answer and said, we will admit you as a special student without charge. And she really thought that that was because that she was you know, from a, a pretty poor circumstance and that they had recognized that. What she found out later was that the special student status was simply to be able to respond to complaints if the professors or other students complained that here was the this woman in chemistry, and they say, oh, well, she's just a special student. She's not a real student. And she said later, if she had known that, she would have never attended, but she didn't find that out until later. So Ellen Swallow was the first woman to attend MIT in any class. Ellen probably was not aware that she was different from other women. I mean, the women had gone to Vassar, she went to Vassar. I think when she got admitted to MIT, she made the comment, I'm going where no other woman has gone. And so she knew that she was blazing the trail at that time. 
As the first student, she was in the lab. She sat side by side with the men who were in there. The problem was, as she saw the need for more women to have science background so they could teach, essentially, was that they weren't willing to admit a whole lot more women and, and put the women in the classes. And that's what led her to work then to get the women's laboratory set up. They gave her an old garage space and said, okay, here's your space, but you have to buy the equipment to put in there. So she went to the women's group there in Boston and begged $2,000 from them and then went to Europe and bought the supplies and came back and set up a chemistry lab. Early in Ellen's life she made astute observations that education was the key to everything and she realized that women were being shortchanged and she could tell particularly in scientific area they were trying to teach and they were trying to teach science with no background, no laboratory experience, and so she actually put together a correspondence course and corresponded with hundreds of women all over the country with scientific studies. She would even lay out the experiments and they would do them at home and then you know, report back to her so that they could learn how to teach others. At the same time Ellen earned her BS in chemistry at MIT, she was also awarded the master's at Vassar because of her work in vanadium, which was a mineral that she helped isolate and discover. She wanted very much to do the research to earn a doctorate, and it was unfortunate at the time that MIT did not want to award the first doctorate to a woman, and so she was never given that, that award. During Ellen's early time at MIT, she was working as an assistant in the chemistry lab. And while she was there, one of the professors there managed to come by and observe her quite often, Robert Richards. He was a professor in mining, and they seemed to strike up a relationship, friendly at first because she was a student and he was a professor, but he was very taken with her abilities. And he actually courted her for nearly two years before she finally said yes, because she had said at one time, there's no man that can convince me to leave my independence. There's no record that indicates that after she graduated from MIT that she went back to those chemical companies asking for a position or a job. She did wonder a little bit about what was going to be next until she was offered the position as assistant in the chemistry lab and then moved on into assistant professor and professor. It is interesting though to see that as she gained her proficiency in water testing, how many companies ultimately came to her for her expertise and she gladly became a consultant. So she never went to work for them, but they certainly recognized her, her expertise and her value. After Ellen and Robert Richards were married, they chose to move out of the city proper of Boston, mainly to get away from the tenement style living side by side with no fresh air circulating. They moved to Jamaica Plain where they had a freestanding home that had four sides and lots of air and enjoyed being away from the hustle and bustle of the city. Now they had to both commute back to MIT but she thought and they both agreed that the quality of life was better and she actually turned their home into a living working laboratory and would test how much it cost to cook a certain food item and was just the efficiency expert and her home became that living laboratory. In addition to her home in Jamaica Plain, she was a few blocks from Jamaica Pond, which was a, a beautiful environmental landscape, if you would, and she made it her goal every day to walk down to the pond and either walk around it or bicycle. The New England kitchen was an experiment with her friend in an effort to try to feed the poor people in the Boston area better food at a lower cost. And she knew there, were, there was better food and that she wanted to show how it could be done. She went on from the New England kitchen to work on another project that had a little more visibility and somewhat more success, and that was the Rumford kitchen as part of the Chicago Exposition in 1893. She designed this standalone house that was set up with the kitchen and had all kinds of nutritional information posted around the wall and they were serving nutritional meals at a low cost. And over the course of the exposition, they served thousands of people this meal and hopefully taught them a little bit about nutrition at the same time. 
After the exposition, she continued the thought of nutritious meals at a low cost and was instrumental in getting the school lunch program started in Boston. This had not been done to this point. Basically, children were eating what the janitors provided them because the janitors would sell it to them. And the school lunch program really can owe its beginnings to her persistence at this time in the late 1800s. The Lake Placid conferences were significant in the home economics movement because late in the 1800s the home economics domestic science movement was super saturated just waiting for something to make it crystallize and Ellen's relationship with Melville Dewey he invited her to their summer home in the Adirondacks at Lake Placid she eventually invited more of her contemporaries and each year they would have a summer conference at Lake Placid and talk about the discipline and how it needed to be organized and arranged and and Ellen used the term home economics, and it was actually called domestic science by people like Catherine Beecher way back in the 1850s. But Ellen became interested when it was obvious that industry had long since outpaced the home. The loom was left in the attic. The soap kettle was in the shed. The home no longer was the production place that it was in the 16, 1700s and the early 1800s. And so she became interested in the science of running the home. And so that's when she began to call it home science or home economics. People started questioning Ellen about what are the standards that we should set forth for a well-run home that has the qualities that you think you should have for the art of right living she used to talk about. And when people started asking her those questions, then she began to think about the different aspects of what she considered to be this healthy home. That was the beginning of her thoughts of this as being science within itself. There was a, a controversy over naming the new discipline of the science of household economics. She wanted to call it economics. Her friend Melville Dewey said, there's already economics in there. You need to call it something else. She finally committed to home economics and said, it really doesn't make any difference what we call it as long as home is in there because that's what's important. Ellen Swallow Richard's legacy is quite far flung. Everything from the nutritional information that she sent out in so many different venues to her sheer dogged pursuit of education for women and never giving up on a goal and dream that she had. And certainly her legacy would be the hundreds of thousands of men and women in the profession of home economics, human sciences, human ecology, who are proud of their heritage and proud of the practice that they can do in the 21st century. A legacy that she's left for all of us would be our 21st century students in family and consumer science who will learn and live and lead in a century that most of us won't see.